Hey guys, it's Vince with Keystone Metal. Uh, we're here in my shop in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania today. I have the TIG 200 LCD machine next to me and we're gonna go over a few different tips and tricks that you guys can practice at home to work on your TIG skills. One of the first projects that we have here is building a cube. Um, I always say that this task is good for a few different things. It helps you control your heat. It's also going to help us keep our parts square. If you put too much heat into one of your welds and one of the sides, the top or the bottom, you'll notice that your part has pulled and you're no longer flush to the table or whatever your surface is that you're building. So one of the first things that I like to touch base on when we're building a cube is most people think that they can just take one piece and stack it on top of the other. Same with this and then build out like that. However, you end up with uh, more of a rectangle that way. So what you actually need to do is put your two edges together so that you're creating a nice fillet weld on the corner here. And you're gonna make sure that all of your inside walls are touching, but none of your outside walls are touching. And that's gonna give you a good joint to practice your, your bead consistency and your heat control in. I'm set at 125 amps. I'm just gonna bump it up to about 150. We'll get this angled correctly so that our inside walls are square and our outside walls are not touching. What I'm gonna do first is put a couple tacks on the inside so that I'm not running over them on the outside when I do my pass. These two tacks on the inside are gonna hold this proper. One way to get started with this, you might be asking, how do I make sure that my two inside faces are flush while I'm holding it without the material slipping off? One easy trick is you can butt two pieces up together. This is gonna give you the elevation that you need and then you can just creep it over to the spot that you need to be so you're flush on your second wall here. Make sure your two corners are square and flush. Once you get your first couple tacks on, the first thing you wanna check and see is your first tacking joint here gonna be square. I'm out at the bottom, so I need to bring the top in. All I'm gonna do is apply a little bit of pressure, bend my tacks a little bit. Once I feel them move, I'll recheck. Now we're pretty square here. We can move on to the other side and we're gonna replicate this process to make sure that each side is square until we can put our top on to hold everything together. When we go to put our final piece on, it's just gonna sit right on top, just like this piece here sitting right on top. All you gotta do is make sure your gap's even all the way around, good to go. So we'll throw a fuse tack right in the corner here. Do another one on this corner. All right, so now that we got everything all tacked up, all our walls are on, you can check to see if it's square, all your sides, your top, your bottom. Now we can start filling in all of our fillet welds um, all the way around the cube. And if I were to make a suggestion, all I would do is alternate corners. So if you do your top right up here, roll it, weld this one, twist it, weld this one, roll it, weld this one kind of like a Rubik's Cube until you're getting all done. You don't want to concentrate all your heat into one corner. Putting a lot of heat onto this side of the cube while leaving this side of the cube chilled, not recommended. All right guys, so one thing I just want to touch base on when we're doing these passes here is going to be your travel speed. Just kind of keeping the torch moving and dabbing while you're moving instead of sitting in the same spot for several seconds. Um, this is going to eliminate the amount of heat that you're inputting into the material and it's going to keep it evenly dispersed. All right guys, take all these tips, practice them at home, and then learn from your own cube. So check everything, check your squareness, wherever you have issues, build another one, try to learn from your previous mistakes and uh, keep improving. All right guys, so another tip that you guys can practice at home is your pipe work or tubing. Um, as a welder, a lot of the jobs that you're going to get are custom exhaust, maybe roll cages, stuff like that. Knowing how to do tube work and pipe work is only going to benefit you in your career. So let's talk about the two most common types of fits that you're going to see when it comes to doing tubing. Uh, the first one is going to be your slip joint. So you're going to have one tube that slips inside the other joint. Um, this is my preferred method. I like to do this because A, it's stronger. You have all the expanded piece of your tube here, it's gonna help you and aid in any, in any rigidity purposes. Um, the other reason I like this is because it helps with articulation and fitment. So if you're building a, an exhaust on a car, um, if you come up a little long, you can always squeeze it in. If you come up a little short, you can always move it out. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can always overexpand just slightly 
the expanded side of your tubing and that is going to help you with articulation, being able to move your pipe up and down like this or left and right to hit the fitment points that you need. So the other joint that you're going to see when it comes to the tube welding is a butt weld. So it's two edges, two ends of the piping right up to each other. Um, typically this has to be a perfect fit. If it's not a perfect fit and you have a gap in the top or the bottom, wherever it is, it's going to create a weak point in the weld. So we'll get into welding this. Whenever you're approaching any TIG weld, it's always important to make sure that your tungsten has a very sharp point to it. Um, this can be achieved by using these Eastwood tungsten grinders. I have one corded here, one cordless. This is great for being on the road, being on the truck, whatever. These are always easy and it's always going to make sure that you have a good bead profile and arc control. Once you go to dab your tungsten or you touch it with your filler wire or whatever it may be and you start to round that point off, what ends up happening is your arc starts to wander. It makes it very hard to control your heat and your bead. You'll get something sloppy, it won't look consistent. So we'll get into welding this pipe real quick. Um, one thing that I like to do is chuck it up into a vise or something that's gonna hold this so that it's not rolling around. You can break this down into four different corners. Um, You'll start north. If you're a right-hander, you can weld north to west and then rotate it, weld north to west. If you're a lefty, you can weld north to east and then rotate it, weld north to east. Basically, all you wanna do is start back a couple beads. We touched on that in our last video. Keep your tie-ins clean. Make sure it's not stacking on top of each other and you're not burning through by putting excess heat into a spot that you just terminated a weld. Always put your tacks on prior to doing your circumference welds. Um, the bigger the diameter, obviously the more tacks you use. Something small like this, you can get away with three, maybe four tacks. If you're going larger in diameter, a foot, two foot, you need to expand it and put 10, 20, 30, 40 tacks, however many it is. I'm just gonna throw three tacks on this for now. They're fusion tacks and then we'll chuck it up in here. We'll add our wire and we'll get to rolling. All right, so we got three tacks on here. Put it in our vise. Whenever you guys squeeze piping in your vise, be gentle about it. You don't want to oval out the pipe by putting too much pressure on it, just enough to hold it, it's fine. So what I'm gonna do is, I did three tacks on this. I'm gonna try my best to just connect the tacks. So it's only gonna be three passes total. Um, another thing that you want to focus on when you're welding tube is your, your torch angle. People have a tendency to walk up the tube and around the radius without rotating their torch head. So this is gonna cut off all your shielding gas on the prior beads that you laid. What I like to do is make sure you're rotating your wrist as you're coming around the radius of the tube so that you're evenly dispersing your shielding gas throughout the whole entire pass. Okay, so we just did our first pass. I'm just taking it out of the vise. I'm gonna rotate it a little bit, chuck it back up. We'll do another pass here until we get completely all the way around. Okay, so one thing I want to point out is that when you're welding a lap joint or a slip joint here, I'm focusing my arc on the lower piece, and when I add, I'm kind of washing it into the upper joint here. And this helps me kind of walk it into the wall instead of trying to blend two pieces together. All right, so we just finished up our slip joint weld here. The next one that we're gonna jump into is a butt weld, and I'm gonna show you how I like to set these up before I start welding them. Once I know that I have a good fitment here and I'm prepared to weld, again, I'm gonna practice the same theory. I'm gonna make sure that my tungsten is sharp. I'm gonna insert three to four tacks on here to make sure it's not gonna pull. So now that we have this tacked up, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna chuck it up in the vise, break it down into three, four, five passes if necessary, if that's what you need. We'll get started and uh, see how it goes. Do our first pass, loosen the vise, rotate it to a comfortable position, start a couple beads back. Remember to rotate your wrist as you're going around the radius of the tube. All right, so that's the last pass on the butt joint. Uh, there's some tips and tricks for pipe, so let's move on to our next topic. All right, so just to touch base on a couple things that we can do to help us achieve a good weld in a tight, uh, tight angle space like this. 
One thing we can do is up our CFH. We're gonna increase our cubic feet per hour on our, on our shielding gas. Um, another thing that we can do is we can pull our tungsten out of our, of our nozzle a little bit here. Now, I only recommend doing this if we take one of another steps, which is going to be switching to a gas lens kit. This welder is gonna come with a gas lens from the factory, so you don't need to be worried about making that switch. I'm currently set up with a Furet cup right here. Eastwood also offers their own Pyrex cup version of this. Um, basically, we're just gonna shove this torch in here as far as we can go, light up and move up as we go. All right, so the first thing I did here is what's called like a lay wire technique. Basically what you're doing is you're just laying your filler wire into the joint and you're gonna hold it stationary while you're using your torch to kind of blend everything in. Um, and then instead of doing a downhill, I walked uphill with this, which is typical. Um, I'm gonna turn it this way now and try to give you guys a different angle. So again, practicing the lay wire technique, I have my wire just sitting in here and all I'm kind of doing is moving my, forth back and my torch back and forth to create the puddle consistency I need with the available material that's already waiting for me. It's kind of just a move and pause, almost like a whip and pause with a MIG gun. And then we terminate slow, let our post flow sit. And that's gonna give us a weld all the way up our joint, nice and clean, good color to it. All right, so those were some techniques for tight corners. One thing I do want to touch on, if you do increase your nozzle size, make sure that it still fits into the joint. It might benefit you more to keep a smaller nozzle that's going to fit into a tight corner a little bit better. So again, um, extended tungsten, switch to a gas lens, maybe go with a bigger nozzle and increase your, um, your cubic feet per hour on your shielding gas. And those are all things that are going to help you get into a tight corner whenever you're TIG welding. All right, so the fourth and final thing that we're gonna talk about today is uh, dissimilar thicknesses in your material. Um, this happens pretty often in the field. You'll go to weld something and one piece that you're welding is significantly thicker than the other piece that you're welding, but you have to weld them both together. So first and foremost, obviously, I think it's pretty apparent when you have a thicker piece than a thinner piece, your concentration is gonna to be to keep most of your heat onto the thicker piece as to not blow away the thinner piece while you're attempting to weld. To piggyback off of that, I wanna to touch base off the filler rod that you're gonna introduce into your puddle here. Here, I have two different thickness filler rods. One's 045, which is pretty common, and another one's 332nd. If I have a material here that's looking at it, it this is about uh, 16 gauge, so it's 062. It's significantly thinner than this filler rod. So this being the thickest on the bottom, and then my filler rod being the second thickest, and then my upper piece here being the thinnest. It's gonna require more heat for me to melt the larger piece and the filler rod than it is for me to melt the, the top piece here. So what I wanna do is switch to a thinner rod, something that this is gonna be the first material that melts. So what we're gonna do is we'll arc up, we'll initiate, we'll keep all of our heat onto the thicker piece at first, and then once we initiate a puddle, we're gonna slide up into the joint, which is where we'll add our filler wire and kinda wash our puddle into the thinner piece. The concentration here is gonna be on the thicker piece, keeping all of our heat, most of our heat, out of the thinner piece to avoid warping, pooling, or blowing a hole through the thinner stuff as we're trying to melt the thicker stuff. So we'll get this tacked up as usual here, and then we'll get into the weld, and I'll show you some techniques as uh, we're under the hood to help you kind of understand what I'm talking about a little bit better. Tacks are the same way. We're gonna initiate our arc on the thicker piece, and once we've created a, a liquid puddle on the thicker piece. We're kind of just gonna wash it up into the thinner piece to blend it and hold them together. <clears throat> One other tip that I do wanna show you guys is when you're welding a joint like this and you have to start in a corner, what happens a lot is when you go to arc up on the corner, the corner's gonna blow away on you. So one trick I'm gonna show you guys is hang your wire off of the edge here. So you'll see that my wire is sticking about maybe a quarter inch over the edge here, my thin piece here. So what's gonna happen, you'll see I'm gonna arc up and as soon as I arc up, this filler rod is gonna turn into a ball and it's gonna suck back right into the corner. Once that happens, I'll stop, I'll blend that in a little bit and then we'll reinitiate the beginning of the weld so I can show you guys how that works. So let's get started with that right now. All right, so as you can see, we have uh, an abundance of material now here in the corner. I now feel a lot more comfortable arcing up in that corner without blowing it away. So I'm gonna arc up in this corner, I'm gonna keep my tungsten favoring the thicker material. And once I get a puddle welded and I start introducing my wire, each bead that I lay, I'm kind of gonna wash up into the thinner piece here. And that's gonna help me blend them without burning away the thinner piece.
All right, so to backpack off of the washing up technique, um, we can introduce the lay wire technique for this as well. Uh, basically what we're gonna do is arc up, create the puddle. Once we have our puddle going, we're gonna insert our filler rod and then we're kind of just gonna weave it. It's almost like a, you're walking the cup, except you're not really walking the cup, you're kind of just weaving. And basically what we're doing is taking the material from the bottom shelf that's thicker and as we wash it up to the upper shelf that's thinner, we're taking the filler rod with us that's already there. Okay, so here we have all, everything that we did today on the table. They'll make you very versatile in the welding world. They'll open up a lot of doors for you, a lot of opportunities, and it's stuff that all you guys can practice at home. All right, everyone. It's also time to wrap up our latest giveaway of three Contour DSBs to lucky subscribers. The winners are Diorama86, JWC Motorsports, and John Grant1337. And as a bonus, Catherine O'Neill1420, you are getting a Contour SCT. To collect your prize, email me social at eastwood.com with the subject line contest winner, and I'll follow up and make sure your stuff gets out to you. Thanks everyone for liking, subbing, and commenting, and congratulations to our winners.